Hello, um, in this uh, mind map, we are going to now start looking at some of the clinical manifestations of uh, thyroid disease. So this is clinical pathologic correlation. Bear in mind the anatomy, the relations, as well as the function. Um, you can divide this into two major categories. So this applies to most of the endocrine organs. It could be due to abnormal function of the hormones, or it also could be due to a goiter, or in other words, an enlargement. A goiter is a non-specific term, it just refers to any enlargement of the thyroid. It can be due to benign or malignant causes. And also, it's very important to take note that abnormal function as well as enlargement can coexist. So let's start off by looking at abnormal function. And uh, remember the um, endocrine axis, the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Um, the primary disease is considered uh, at when there is thyroid disease itself right at the end organ. And if it's uh, pituitary or hypothalamic, then it's considered as secondary disease. And remember the pituitary actually produces TSH, which then acts on the thyroid gland to produce T3 and T4. Now, in terms of abnormal function, again, it's very simple. It can either be increased function, which we term hyperthyroidism, or, of course, the opposite, which is decreased function, which is hypothyroidism. So let's look at some of the clinical features first. And um, this uh, usually would have quite a bit of uh, clinical symptoms and signs. The heart rate would be up in hyperthyroidism as opposed in hypothyroidism usually there is bradycardia or slowing of the heart rate um, the appetite is actually increased in hyperthyroidism as opposed to decreased in hypothyroidism so these features all relate to the basal metabolic rate um, in addition there is a uh, weight change as well. So for hyperthyroidism, despite an increased appetite, often uh, the weight uh, goes down. So patients may be quite happy because they're losing weight but eating more. Whereas in contrast, unfortunately, in hypothyroidism, decreased appetite yet increase in weight because of the slowing down of the BMR or basal metabolic rate. And we can have other symptoms, uh, usually such as heat intolerance in hypothyroidism versus cold intolerance in hypothyroidism. Or sometimes uh, patients may complain of feeling very nervous or anxious or irritable in hyperthyroidism. And if we were to examine uh, them by holding, asking them to hold the hand out um, horizontally uh, with an extended arm, uh, you can sometimes see a tremor. So you can look up the other clinical signs and symptoms. Sometimes the bowel movements can be affected and also the um, menstrual cycle. Now in terms of biochemistry, we actually test for hyperthyroid versus hypothyroid states. And there are two main things that we test for. TSH, which if you remember is produced by the pituitary gland, and free T4, which is thyroxine or tetraiodothyronine. Now, um, TSH is very important. The level of TSH is very important because it tells you whether it is a primary cause, meaning from the thyroid, or a secondary cause, meaning from the pituitary. So think about this. If you have a primary cause uh, giving rise to hyperthyroidism, usually the TSH level will be low because there is negative feedback. So have a look at this diagram here. This is taken from a website called... Uh, Geeky Medics. So you can just Google this geekymedics.com slash hyperthyroidism. And this diagram very nicely shows you the axis. Okay, so we have the hypothalamus that produces TRH, thyrotropin releasing hormone. This stimulates the pituitary gland, which in turn produces thyroid stimulating hormone, TSH. And this then stimulates the thyroid gland to produce T3 and T4. So if we have a state of primary hyperthyroidism where the thyroid gland is overproducing T3 and T4, there will always be a negative feedback loop back to the pituitary gland and back to the hypothalamus. So in primary hyperthyroidism, T3 and T4 are up, or at least free T4 is high, but because of the negative feedback, usually this leads to TSH being low. Whereas in contrast, in secondary hyperthyroidism, where the source is actually the pituitary, 
The pituitary is the one that produces more or too much TSH, which then stimulates the thyroid to produce more hormone. So TSH is raised. Now, similarly, for hypothyroidism, if it is primary, the TSH will actually be increased because of uh, feedback from the thyroid to the pituitary to produce more T3 and T4 because the thyroid hormone levels are low. And then for secondary, because the cause is up uh, above the thyroid, the TSH and the T4 will both be decreased. Now let's look at some of the causes of hyper and hypothyroidism. Uh, now, Graves' disease is probably the commonest cause of primary hyperthyroidism. Um, if you remember, this is actually an autoimmune disease, which we talked about under the autoimmune category. And how do we know that this is Graves' disease clinically? A very important sign would be eye signs, ophthalmopathy. So kind of a protruding look in uh, the um, eyeballs. And you can see an example of a picture here with a very, very frightening look because of a lot of deposition of extracellular matrix material um, in the orbit. And the other clue for you to know that this is actually Graves' disease as a cause of hyperthyroidism is the presence of specific autoantibodies. And you can read about these specific antibodies in your textbooks. Now, um, sometimes multinodular goiters can also be toxic or even um, a benign neoplasm, usually benign, such as a follicular adenoma. This can sometimes overproduce uh, thyroid hormone, giving rise to primary hyperthyroidism. Um, and um, of course, another cause could be exogenous thyroid hormone uh, for example, um, in patients with um, hypothyroidism, may be post-surgical and they are receiving uh, thyroid hormone. So the dose usually has to be adjusted and sometimes they can go into hyperthyroidism if uh, the dose is too high. Uh, now, in terms of hypothyroidism, a very important cause would be Hashimoto thyroiditis. This is also the other big autoimmune disease. Um, and we can also look for autoantibodies in the blood, so specific blood tests for these. Uh, there's also a, a histologic picture which uh, was discussed during your lecture. Now, iatrogenic causes are very important. Uh, for example, um, in patients who've had previous thyroidectomy, of course, these patients would be hypothyroid unless they are given thyroid hormones um, in terms of the medication. Now, if the patient is receiving any radiation therapy for another cancer, for example, in that region where the thyroid is, this can also give rise to hypothyroidism. And um, other, cause, other causes include uh, congenital or developmental conditions. Um, for example, if there is a hypo, uh, hypoplasia of the thyroid, dysgenesis of the thyroid, or dishormonogenetic goiter where the thyroid hormones are, do not function normally. Now let's move on to goiter or thyroid enlargement and um, a practical way to uh, clinically divide goiter would be diffuse goiter versus a more localized or more nodular appearance. So uh, one of the most important and common causes of diffuse goiter is Graves' disease and we've already talked about it here. So you can see that this um, clinical manifestation occurs both in terms of enlargement as well as abnormal function. Uh, the other important uh, causes include simple goiter. This is usually endemic due to iodine deficiency before it progresses to multinodular goiter. And decoivin thyroiditis can also give rise to a small degree of uh, diffuse swelling. Now, opposite to this is a more nodular appearance or more localized or discrete types of swelling. And these can be divided more now in terms of the cause into non-neoplastic causes versus neoplastic causes. Now, um, the non-neoplastic ones are more likely to be multinodular, meaning that there is, there is enlargement of both sides just asymmetrically. So we have examples of multinodular goiter. Decoivin thyroiditis can sometimes also cause a more discrete appearing swelling. Even Hashimoto thyroiditis, which is usually diffuse and mild, can sometimes cause a nodular kind of appearance. So these are some of the non-neoplastic causes of, of goiter. And now we move on to the neoplasms and uh, we would first want to stratify them as always into benign versus malignant. So for benign neoplasms, it's very simple. There's actually really only one entity, follicular adenoma. And Herthel cell adenoma is a variant of follicular adenoma. So 
Essentially, there's really only one entity. Um, it's an encapsulated nodule, which is composed usually of very small follicles, very uniform follicles. And sometimes there is this uh, oncocytic or Hertel cell appearance in the cells, at which time we call it Hertel cell adenoma. Now, when it comes to malignant nodules, uh, we want to sort of first think about where these nodules come from. So what compartment or what component of the thyroid parenchyma. So we have those that arise from the follicular cells and obviously those that are non-follicular cell in origin. So among the follicular cell tumors, these are the most common, we can then call them the well-differentiated group of tumors, which includes papillary thyroid carcinoma, the commonest thyroid carcinoma, followed by follicular carcinoma. These are by definition well-differentiated. Then we have the poorly differentiated thyroid carcinoma. And finally, getting even worse, this is the anaplastic carcinoma of the thyroid. Very, very poor prognosis. Now for the non-follicular cell ones, um, generally there are two main things, medullary thyroid carcinoma and lymphoma. So these are the commoner primary tumors in the thyroid. Of course, this is not a comprehensive list. There are other types of tumors that can occur here. Uh, take note that papillary and medullary carcinoma can sometimes be associated with familial cancer syndromes. And also, medullary carcinoma can, uh, can be a part of the MEN syndrome, multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome. So in terms of the well-differentiated thyroid carcinomas, these are by far the commonest types of malignant thyroid tumors. Uh, papillary versus follicular, they look different. So take note of the differences in terms of morphology. You can uh, see this in your lecture notes as well as your textbooks. And also take note that they spread differently um, through different routes. One through lymphatics, which is PTC, and more through vessels, uh, follicular carcinoma, which is why the mets usually occur in different locations. And I'm sure you can work this out where the mets occur.